boy, Linus really stoked some flames, eh? Go watch his video if you missed it, but in summary, YouTube has been experimenting with limiting 4K and higher views of videos to premium subscribers only. And Linus just posted a video defending this move and explaining why it might actually be necessary from a business perspective. A lot of what he said is actually pretty spot on, but I feel he missed a lot, both in favor and against this change. I'm supposed to be releasing my Intel 13th gen coverage today, but due to some weird motherboard incompatibility with XMP, my data would be useless, so I'll post this instead and hope for the best, I guess. Eposfox.gg slash merch. It's really hard to fathom just how expensive YouTube's video pipeline is. Expensive in money, time, resources, and space. If you upload a video to YouTube, say this 13 and a half minute OBS quality update video, that's just the first step of many. First, I upload the video. It's a 4K 60fps video exported in the HEVC codec, which came out to about 2.6 gigabytes in size. YouTube has to accept that in my local ingest server, then it has to forward that to their transcoding servers, which could be in the same place, could be in another data center entirely, and as well to their archive servers. These transcoding servers squish down your original video into smaller versions that can be more cost-effectively streamed to viewers around the world. YouTube has a set of recommended bitrate settings for your videos to upload with, but I have always, for over a decade now, considered these to be neglectful at best, as while they, the, the settings may be okay for local video under the best of conditions, if you limit yourself to these settings for a file you're running through YouTube's com, you know, squishy compression, it's gonna look like poop. Historically, YouTube always kept your originally uploaded file. They use these to create better copies once they have improved their encoding pipeline. Most notably in 2016 when they introduced 60 FPS or frames per second playback and suddenly all of the 2009 era gaming videos that were uploaded in 60 frames per second could be viewed at double the frame rate that they had been available at for years. It was pretty wild. That means keeping your original fat file on their servers, but also keeping many redundant copies of it as part of their, of their usual safe data storage policies. You know, three, two, one backup rule, but at scale. More recently, YouTube has announced that they'd only be keeping source files for six months, but I've had community members say that they can still download all of their original uploads via Google Takeout. So I'm not really sure where that stands. Beyond storing your original bulky file, which has to be a much higher bitrate than YouTube delivers to ensure that you don't lose a ton of quality from YouTube's lossy compression, and that uploaded file can go as high as 120 gigabytes, which used to have a higher limit, but they lowered it a few years back. They also then have to transcode or convert it into compressed formats that you can actually watch back. YouTube doesn't let you watch the originally uploaded video file for... Most users, it would be way too much data to process and way more bandwidth intensive for YouTube to pay for. Bad deal. Instead, they compress it using a variety of quality control factors to get it as small as possible to stream to the viewer. That starts with the different resolutions that YouTube supports. For 4K, that's eight different formats. 4K, 1440p, 1080p, 720p, 480p, 360p, 240p, and 144p. But they don't just make eight copies of the video. In fact, they make far more. Your video first gets an AVC, or H.264 encode, that's used for quick playback as they get a better copy of the video available and for playing back on devices that don't support their newer codecs. And then if you upload 1440p or higher resolution video, there's a VP9 transcode. Although it's worth noting too that for a few years now, YouTube already goes ahead and encodes every video in both H.264 and VP9, but just doesn't show the VP9 copy to viewers on 1440p and lower videos until they get more popular for some reason. Weird. VP9 is Google's own open source codec designed to be more efficient than H.264 for your video to save on bandwidth even more. People often mistake videos that get this format as inherently having higher quality, but that's not necessarily true. VP9 is used to save on bandwidth. Sometimes videos can actually look worse in VP9 than in H.264 when they were originally uploaded. In actuality, music video fans have been able to watch video quality degrade over time as multiple passes and attempts at squishing bandwidth costs down for these absurdly viewed videos over time just destroy it. My favorite one is a K-pop music video, Mr. Taxi by Girls' Generation. It never looked amazing due to all the tiny details and lights that they use in the background, but on a nearly annual basis for a while, I could look back and see it get squished more and more in quality and then at some point receive a TV syndicated transcode with interlacing baked in that got recompressed again, giving the video combing artifacts all over it that weren't originally there in 2012. 
Google hasn't been happy with the performance and adoption of VP9, which is why they've helped co-found the Alliance for Open Media, an organization consisting of basically every company in media and streaming today developing a royalty-free streaming codec AV1, which saves a ton on bandwidth and doesn't cost any licensing fees like H.265 and H.266 would. Even H.264 has licensing fees, but those fees are just a lot more reasonable and have gotten even more reasonable over time, and they come from a centralized entity. Some high traffic or even higher resolution videos also get a third AV1 copy on YouTube today as well. This will continue being more widely available as YouTube's hardware rolls out more in their servers. So that's a minimum of 24 transcoded copy of a singular video plus the original, all stored in multiple places for redundancy and cached in many, many data centers to be more quickly streamed to viewers all over the planet. But even this is a vast oversimplification of the transcode steps on YouTube. Videos frequently get multiple passes on each codec where we've seen videos lose quality from one AVC version available immediately to the version that it gets later on a couple hours later maybe, likely a means of load balancing their server power or something. There's instances where videos have to be squished down more kind of manually, as was the case with Digital Foundry's original Quake 2 RTX video, where the non-denoised video section reached over 50 megabits per second in the original YouTube transcoded copy at just 1080p and was genuinely too much data for YouTube's Dash streaming protocol to keep up with and play back, even for viewers with fiber internet connections and more than enough, you know, download speed to stream the video theoretically. That video had to be manually re-encoded by someone on the back end at YouTube just to be watchable. That's why Digital Foundry has their downloads available on their website, I guess. YouTube's always changing things and re-encoding things, and the higher resolution you send, the more that's needed there. And none of this is even covering HDR, which has its own, you know, quirks and needs, and then a whole separate HDR to SDR tone mapping pipeline as well. Now also consider the bandwidth costs of sending that back out to viewers. The 4K copy of this video in the compressed VP9 format is 1.2 gigabytes. With an average of 1 million views per LTT video within the first week, that would be 1.2 petabytes of data streamed out. Now 4K is a smaller percentage of the overall viewership, but you get the idea. That's a ton of data. This process is expensive and incredibly complicated, and YouTube provides this service for free to everyone. You can store as many 1080p, 4K, 8K, hell, 16K videos if you wanted on YouTube as you want completely for free, even if they're kept private or unlisted and you're not earning YouTube any money with them. That is a unicorn of a resource and it cannot be understated how impossible that is to replace. You're not getting that anywhere else. Ever. YouTube serves as a global repository for family memories, education, guides on how to fix the most obscure things that could be lost to time, world events, news, and cat videos. YouTube has a responsibility to maintain that and not just start deleting videos as they see fit or let the service crumble and lose all of that irreplaceable data. But it also has to justify the costs in some way. They are a publicly traded company, after all. Linus already covered all the business side that he knows better than I do. So instead of talking about ads and subscriptions, let's talk about the files. As YouTube's number one AV1 advocate and hype train conductor, surely I'd say AV1 is the savior we need here, right? Well, yeah, but also no. I actually think Linus is both right and wrong about you not needing 4K. He's right in that so many people on mobile and desktop don't have 4K screens and would theoretically not see any benefit from watching in 4K anyway. But he's wrong when you move from theory to practical application. YouTube's video encodes, on average, are pretty poor quality and not, they're not a very efficient use of the encoders at play half the time anyway. Quality is the problem, not resolution. Let's not forget that it was LTT itself that kind of led the charge for 4K video becoming the normal viewing experience on YouTube, at least for tech videos, even when only filming in 1080p, due to the advantages of 4K on YouTube. YouTube videos get higher bit rates and now access to higher efficiency codecs, which at the time were almost a requirement to make anything more than a still talking head video like this one viewable. Video quality at 1080p has actually improved a little bit since then, at least on newer videos, and 1440p is a comfortable middle ground that wouldn't be paywalled by this change, at least yet, but these advantages still matter today. Bit rate is the number of bits, which is the data, assigned to each second of footage. 
and up to some level of diminishing returns, more bitrate is more better. 1080p and lower have historically always been super limited in how much bitrate YouTube would allocate to them for, for the videos to be compressed with and then streamed to viewers, resulting in macro blocking or what some often call pixelization, color banding, and other sorts of artifacts such as blurring. Due to the requirements of the format, YouTube typically allocates higher maximum bit rates and higher quality targets for 1440p and especially for 4K footage in their transcodes, which makes it worth it to even upscale high quality 1080p footage to 4K for YouTube posting so viewers can have the best viewing experience possible. 8K goes even further with this, which had for a while inspired me to try moving to an 8K pipeline for my videos. Even if you don't have a 4K screen, watching videos in 4K on YouTube gives you more detail and visibility thanks to the advantages of downscaling, performing a sort of super sampling of the image. This is where the pixels that you're seeing are actually an average of many more pixels, giving them the ability to resolve more detail. Plus, 4K TVs are everywhere now. You can get them for like 100 bucks, even if it's less common on the PC monitor front. And all of your Apple TV, Roku boxes, and consoles can stream YouTube in 4K, either via VP9 or now often AV1 as well. So 4K may still be a smaller percentage of the formats being viewed, because that's just how these things work, and internet connections. But it's far from insignificant, and you don't actually need 4K isn't actually true yet, but it could be. All of these advantages I just described to 4K on YouTube are band-aids to poorer quality at lower resolutions. We need 4K because 1080p is trash, not because we need 4K. There's all those exposed videos about how many 4K movies up to a certain point aren't real 4K because they're shot on RE Alexa cams that cap out at 2K resolution or use 2K intermediates for editing and color grading and blah blah blah. As Linus tried explaining with some mixed up terms, Image quality isn't entirely dependent on resolution, like, at all. But as point stands, a, a well-produced and high bitrate 1080p video looks far better than a crap 4K video. AV1 can save the day here, kinda. I've already shown that AV's one bandwidth reduction can be insane with a 4K interview taking up a mere 753 megabytes versus the HEVC copy being over 9 gigabytes in the right conditions. And I have more videos coming on some magic we can do with that very soon. But even with Linus's video specifically, ripping it in full 4K VP9, it sits at an average overall bitrate of maybe 16 megabits per second and 1.2 gigabytes in size. Compressing that using Intel's AV1 encoder on their ARC A380 graphics card, and this is already using the lossless YouTube copy as a source, it would be far more efficient to do so on a lossless copy, I can compress it down to a mere 400 megabytes and still retain most of the quality and sharpness. It would be far smaller using the non-hardware accelerated SVT AV1 encoder with a very slow preset number, but that would take days to encode. But Google has their own AV1 encoding hardware, so that that limitation doesn't apply to them. If used properly and not to just cut file sizes in half or something, AV1 at 1080p could allow for much, much higher quality at the same bitrate, or some higher quality at a slightly lower bitrate, right from the jump. Plus, with AV1's grain synthesis feature, if implemented properly on YouTube, even smaller files could be squeezed out while retaining film grain and the creator's artistic vision or original look in ways that have literally never been possible before on YouTube. Going beyond that, AV1 has native 10-bit support. 10-bit is a color depth that isn't used for a lot of non-HDR consumer videos right now, but fixes a lot of issues that 8-bit lossy compression has. It's required for HDR, but IMO, with the adoption of AV1, 10-bit should be used for all SDR video too. In fact, Netflix already encodes all of their new 1080p AV1 streams in 10-bit formats when playing on compatible devices, of course, showing the, the higher quality potential here. We've already seen 10-bit produce more efficient results in general with HEVC, which is why the piracy scene has quickly adopted 10-bit HEVC as the preferred format for all videos. But it also fixes the issue of color banding. Color banding and gradients or big areas of similar colors is an issue that results not only from low bit rates, but from 8-bit video in general and is fixed with 10-bit. AV1 could fix all of this, breathing life back into the non-4K versions of videos, and thus making it so Linus would be correct in saying, we don't need 4K video. 1080p AV1 videos can look better than YouTube's 4K videos right now, and then 4K on YouTube and AV1 could be a truly premium, see what I did there, viewing experience. But all of that assumes that they implement these features and put the effort into prioritizing the viewing experience, even just a little bit, 
rather than solely focusing on bandwidth savings. It can do both. This also helps storage, as YouTube could transcode everyone's source files into lossless AV1 files for archive and future compression, saving on that initial storage cost of your bulky video. Hell, with AV1, YouTube could allow for, or work with the developers of video editing programs and conversion apps like Handbrake, to let the user create size exact or setting exact AV1 copies of their videos for each of the transcoded resolutions, reduce YouTube's hardware work on their end, and reduce the destruction of generational lossy compression. That's recompressing an already compressed video feed over and over, resulting in worse and worse results. Right now, even if I upload a perfect copy super compressed AV1 video to YouTube, the resulting file would actually get bigger rather than decrease on YouTube servers. That would be similar to how Plex's direct play and other media server solutions work, where the directly encoded stream is shown to the viewer. We currently see this trade-off in H.264 with Twitch, where you can view the source quality, but then you're incredibly limited in both bandwidth and codec support as a result. One obstacle to AV1 rollout is decoder support, though in my opinion, I consider this a non-issue. Whenever AMD announces their next GPUs for this year, we'll have two generations of AMD and NVIDIA GPUs that as well as two generations or three now, I think, of Intel iGPUs with hardware AV1 decoders that support up to 8K60 HDR AV1 video on the hardware. Plenty of TVs and TV adjacent products can decode AV1, even the PS4 Pro can, and 1080p and lower AV1 video can be decoded on CPU on modern phones and any modern quad core processor from the past five or eight years without issue. Plus, as we can see on YouTube, still making H.264 copies of videos at this point, a new protocol doesn't get rid of the old one right away. At least videos aren't an FLV anymore, am I right? The other potential roadblock is protocol. There isn't currently a streaming protocol for AV1, so getting it in real time isn't easy. Clearly, both Netflix and YouTube have figured it out for videos, but streaming is still in the works. Otherwise, we'd be streaming it. Regarding audio quality, I'm not sure what Linus is on about exactly. Uh, I've, I've tried looking into this more. YouTube already uses the Opus audio codec, which is considered transparent or not noticeably different from uncompressed to the average person by most experts at a mere 160 kilobits per second, and surround sound support is finally rolling out. Audio is fine. I do think that most people just trash their audio quality in their export settings and don't really think about it much. But if you export a, to a MOV container instead of MP4 container, you can use PCM Wave uncompressed audio, and it stays completely uncompressed until YouTube compresses it for the final video. That's about as good as it gets. I would like to see audio bit rates improved at lower resolutions. The jump in audio quality from, say, a 4K version of a video to 480p and lower is pretty big. There's nowhere else to go, really, though, other than multiple alternate audio track support, which they keep teasing and not releasing. And then I even saw comments on the video of people saying that they, they just want to see YouTube do more for audio quality. But, like, audio quality in general doesn't need more. They normalize videos that are too loud and have transparent audio encoding. What else is there besides the upcoming surround sound support? I think they should also normalize both down and up to minus 14 LUFS so that there aren't videos that are too quiet instead of just making sure they're not too loud. But what else do you want? Anyway, should YouTube charge for 4K? Honestly, I don't know. It sucks having a feature that has been available for seven or eight years suddenly be taken away and charged for, but it's also an unbelievable miracle that we have all of this free utility from YouTube in the first place. I understand the cost issues that might make it a necessity for YouTube, but it's also hard for people to understand those kinds of things and those needs when a company starts making big profits. Public corporations suck and aren't working in your best interest, but it's it's near impossible to argue that you don't get more from YouTube <laughs> than you probably should already. I feel like with AV1, YouTube could deliver 4K video for nearly the same cost that they do a lot of HD content now, and that would fix a lot of these issues, so it shouldn't be necessary. But I also know that realistically 4K viewers aren't that big of a chunk, and that YouTube Premium would serve both the viewer and the content creators themselves. Uh, watching the... Uh, it would just serve them very well. Remember to be kind. Rewind.